be quiet before the Lord. We've, we've been reminded of the power of the scriptures for our learning, that through endurance we may have hope. This is our prayer. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. <coughs> Amen. Dear friends, it is a delight for myself and my wife to be back at Living Waters Anglican Fellowship in Kingston today. Uh, Chris was reminding us that, in fact, it was Advent 2, I think, the last time I was here. So Advent 2, Bible Sunday in Living Waters, for us, seems to go pretty well. And uh, we're delighted to be with you and uh, want to wish you a very precious time of preparation in this Advent. Don't miss the opportunity of prepare to worship the coming King uh, and also to be anticipating and looking forward to his return. And then for your Christmas, I pray for you and those you love to have a wonderful time of blessing, rejoicing in the fact that exactly as the scripture said, Jesus was born in Bethlehem uh, and that your entry into a new year, 2020, what a, what a good number. <laughs> Hindsight is, you know, anyway. Uh, uh, so we'll all be into 2020, and it'll be very good, and we'll have lots of vision. So, uh, but we're here uh, today, in the second Sunday of Advent, as we continue in this series on uh, uh, some verses from Isaiah 9, a wonderful promise which speaks about Jesus. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. That's what you thought about last week. Mighty God, that's what we're going to think about today. Everlasting Father, that's what you'll be thinking about, I presume, next week. And Prince of Peace, just before Christmas. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And of that son that we're dwelling on, as was read by Yolanda just a few minutes ago, he is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. That's the one we're thinking about today, worthy of our effort to zoom in and focus on him. What could be more important than think of this one today and every day? Now, I want to start by saying these names were obviously carefully chosen by the Spirit of God according to the will of the Father to name the Son who was to be born some 700 years in the future. They were not hyperbole. They were not just light names to get you fired up and somehow help you live another day with some sort of hope in your heart. But just as in Colossians 1, it says of this one Jesus, in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in human form. So that God crammed all the fullness of God in this one body, which was Jesus, this man who was fully man and fully God. And in similar fashion, these words are crammed <coughs> with meaning to help us understand and to begin to know on this eternal quest to know this Jesus for all eternity, who is worthy, who is worthy. What we need to know is that, in fact, the, the phrase that we're thinking about today, mighty God, which refers to Jesus, the Son who is to be born, Mighty God is consistently used in the Old Testament to refer <coughs> to clearly the one God, Yahweh. The Lord of hosts, the Almighty One. 
So there's no way that when these words are used to refer to this one that is to come, that there could be under any misunderstanding as to what is trying to be said about this Jesus. The question, is he God or isn't he God, is a nonsense question if you're a Bible person. Because both Old Testament and New Testament speak in clarity and in power on this question. So that, for instance, in Isaiah 10, a little bit, the next chapter from where we had that, it says, In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. There are a number of times in the Old Testament where in prayer to the mighty God there's an appeal. So that, for instance, in Nehemiah 9 when the people are coming in confession and asking for his forgiveness, they say, you are the Lord. You alone. This is Isaiah, Nehemiah 9, verse 6. You are the Lord. You alone. You made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts the earth and all that is on, in, in on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of the earth of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. And on he go, all they go for some time. So finally at verse 32 it says this, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us. This is an appeal to the one and only living God. And he's described as mighty and awesome God. Jeremiah similarly prayed. Uh, and he said this, uh, Jeremiah 32, After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Moriah, Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, oh, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. You see that in the context of Isaiah 9, for this one to be called not just Wonderful Counselor, but now Mighty God was as high as you could go in language in terms of speaking about the one true God. But then we go to the New Testament. We go to the New Testament and we discover that in fact words are used similarly so that in the Greek the word in the Septuagint Bible which is used for Yahweh is the word which is used he is Lord for instance in Philippians 2 this is the same word the same name this is the mighty one of God and so it is that John 1 and perhaps Christmas Eve you might read what's called the prologue in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the word was God he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him has not anything been made that was made. And later on, we discover that, that this one is clearly that Jesus, he's the word, he's the communication, he's the means, he's the incarnate word of God, just as the Bible is the written word of God. Later in John 8, at a kind of a showdown. You know, Jesus had so many showdowns, didn't he? It seems like controversy followed him everywhere he went because not everybody was welcoming him for who he was. In fact, many that should have known better were the very ones who were resisting with such a hard, cold hearts of stone. And so the Jews that's referring to these folks said to him, you're not speaking to Jesus. You're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. 
Now, he's referring to Exodus 3, where when Moses said, Who shall I say sent me? And he said, You shall say the I Am. And the I Am became so holy a uh, name for God that in fact you probably know that they, off, they would skip the words and sort of just breathe because it was just too holy to even have them on your lips. Uh, and yet here it is that Jesus is identifying that before even this guy Abraham, who's our hero and the a founder of our line, I am. Jesus laid claim to being God. Make no mistake. And so it is that Paul rightly said, as we've already read, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Verse 17, he's before all things and in him all things together. All things were created through him and for him. This is the one that we're talking about. This is the son who is to come in 700 years who is the eternal son of God, but was to take on human flesh in this momentous event that was yet to come. But he who claimed and is God fully, this is Jesus, was born also fully human like us. That's the incredible. I mean, this is, this, is, this is incredible. That the Holy One of God, the mighty God, should come and dwell in frail flesh like you and me. The writer of Hebrews says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, speaking about this one, the Son, likewise partook of the same things, that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and to deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. He took on exactly what we have with flesh so that he could be one with us. And so it is, and I, I, uh, I believe that Chris last week referred to this wonderful passage. It's one of my favorites, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Four, verses 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, that's mighty God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but, was, but one who in every <coughs> respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He can do this because he's fully human. He went, he's been there, done that. Every temptation, every affliction, every form of suffering, anything that could ever come against you, he's already absorbed in himself. And when he stretched out his arms on the cross, he was in fact, by his stripes, we are being healed. So that he who knew no sin could become sin on our behalf so that we could have the righteousness of God and we could live a new life. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, Isaiah said. The risen Lord Jesus declared at the Matthew 28, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him rightly, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Make no mistake that in fact the phrase mighty God, first of all, was not a throwaway line of hyperbole, but in fact were words invested with the full meaning just as Jesus was pleased, all the fullness of God to dwell in his human form. And to be the one who is to come and take on flesh just as you and I do, and to be the one who conquered death and rose from the dead, death could not contain him, and there stood and said, all authority has been given to me. He is the mighty God. 
There could perhaps be one who is called God. He could be well-meaning, but if he's not mighty, where would the world and you and I personally be? He could be full of love, but if not mighty, where would the world and you and I personally be? <coughs> he could be faithful, fully intending to deliver <coughs> on all his promises, but if not mighty, where would the world and you and I, friends, personally be? He could have deep and wise counsel. But if not mighty, where would the world and you and I be, friends? He could be righteous and completely just, pure and holy. But if not mighty, where would the world and you and I personally be? He could hate the darkness and stand against Satan and all his demonic realm. But what if not mighty, where would the world and you and I personally be? What if greater is he who is in the world than he that was in us? What a horrible, horrible thought. But thanks be to God. He is mighty God. Otherwise, we'd all be sunk. But we're not sunk if we're in him who is the mighty God. Thanks be to God, this Jesus is mighty. We see that throughout the whole of the Bible. Think about Psalm 2 where it says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Yikes. This is a scary <coughs> rebellion that is rising up against the Lord's anointed. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. He is the mighty God. Consistently, those who are closest to the, the, uh, and involved in Jesus' birth spoke as particularly about the mightiness of Jesus. So it is that you know that Mary, when she was met by the angel Gabriel, it says, And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, the angel Gabriel said to Mary, For nothing will be impossible with God, mighty God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Later in what we know as the Magnificat, My soul magnifies the Lord, Mary said, <coughs> And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations, Mary says, will call me blessed. <coughs> for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Mary was all about the mightiness of this one. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent have empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. This is the mighty one. Or think of Zechariah after he finally, having all those months of being uh, incapable of speaking because he, he doubted the angel Gabriel, but now in the birth of John, 
and he said his name shall be John and his mouth is opened and he speaks if you know you might know the, it as the Nunc Dimittis uh, no the Benedictus I'm sorry Nunc Dimittis is Simeon dear me the, the Benedictus because it starts blessed Benedictus blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people listen to this Zechariah is prophetically saying and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us mighty God to show mercy promise to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear no fear when you have a mighty God on your side. If God be for us, Paul said in Romans 8, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This is the mighty one, the mighty God that Isaiah is speaking about. If we did a quick, and I'm going to stop, uh, but just to say that if we did a quick analysis of the Gospel of Mark, for instance, I think you'd find that Mark is preoccupied with the mightiness and the authority of this one. So, for instance, he says, and they were astonished at his teaching. This is Mark 1, verse 22. For he taught them as one who had authority. This is the mighty God. Verse 25, but Jesus rebuked this evil spirit, said, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. He's Lord. He's the mighty God. Or think about that encounter in Mark 2 where the guy was lowered down, plopped in front of Jesus, a paralytic. And he said, your sins are forgiven. And some were scandalized by that. And he said, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk, but that you might know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. He said to the man, get up and walk. And he did. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them. So they were all amazed, glorifying God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Because they were in the presence of the mighty God. And they'd seen him act. Mark 2 later it says the Sabbath was, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In Mark 4, there's the account of Jesus asleep in the boat. A trip which he instructed them to take. He's asleep. Suddenly they're overcome and they know they're going down and these are guys who know, knew boating. And so they came and said, don't you care that we're, we're perishing? In verse 39, it says, And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is then this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, mighty God. That's who. Mighty God. We could go on, and I have notes for more, but I'm going to stop uh, out of mercy for all of you, because there is some mercy here. Uh, so what do we do with the mighty God? Well, this is Advent, and, uh, and one of the great passages which frames our thinking and actually frames the collect for Advent, Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness, and it's the First hymn we sang was all about that. That's what it was framed from. Um, and it talks about, about uh, waking up from our slumber. Besides, you know the time, Paul said, that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. Did you realize that you could be in the presence of the mighty God and be asleep? What a thing. I have a friend who, uh, have, uh, years ago, uh, he, he fell asleep while he was driving. 
And uh, the interesting thing about his sleep was his eyes were still open. And so as he went off the road and was careening across this field, fortunately it was a pretty big field, and all the time he was seeing exactly what was happening and he saw the big oak tree up ahead and he was heading and he was absolutely peaceful uh, in this, in this uh, uh, sleep mist, though his eyes were open, seeing all the field going by, 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 tree getting closer, 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 until they, quote, came to rest against the tree. But by then it would slow down enough that he was not killed. But the interesting thing was that he was both, a, he saw, but he was incapable of being aware of the significance or of doing anything about it. Paul says, wake up. Wake up. The mighty one of God is here. And in fact, his return, salvation is nearer now to us than when we first believed. You're supposed to take that personally, friends. This is a personal reality. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. It's very soon. And so, he says, cast away the works of darkness. Very dramatic language. And put on the armor of light. Because as much as we have a foot already in heaven, we're still living in this world which is full of darkness and we have a body which still has a propensity to sin. And so he's saying, make no provision for that. Put on the armor of God because there is a battle and then head towards that glorious coming which is the Lord Jesus. Dramatic stuff. Wake up, friends. Wake up. And wait on him. It's interesting. Awake, but rest in him. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it to be to me according to your word. There is a, an incredible, peaceful sense. Here I am, Lord. You made the promise. I have no clue how the Holy Spirit's going to do this. But go ahead. Because you're the Lord and you're good, I'm waiting on you. Worship him. No fear. He's the mighty God. And he has you in your hand. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Peaceful trust and simple obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It's the only reasonable thing, because he's the mighty God. Would you stand and let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you who are the one who is wonderful counselor and mighty God, we thank you that that's true. Fully, fully, fully true. Just as you fully took all of God on your human body. Lord Jesus, we run to you by faith. We want to be those who are awake for your return. And please give us the peaceful trust of no fear, confident stability to obey you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you are mighty. Amen.